All right. Uh, so first of all, I should warn you that we are recording the call. Okay. So just FYI, and uh, just for those who uh, would skip this call due to various reasons, and uh, uh, also I just want to let you know that uh, you can also ask questions in the chat. But at the same time, feel free to, to stop the speaker. I, in fact, I believe that if we have it more in a discussion way, it would be more fruitful and everyone would benefit from it. I think that uh, interested people should use the opportunity of having such a person in a call and ask uh, as many questions as possible. Uh, said that, I wanna greet Irgar and say good morning to him. As you know, he's joining us from Austin, the capital of the Texas. Uh, can you hear me, Ilgar? Uh, yes, yes. Good morning. I can hear you. How are you doing? Good. You? Yeah, thank you. So as you see, uh, we're SP Azerbaijan and all of us, we don't forget our graduate students and we're trying to uh, keep up with our connections and uh, in general to have sessions. Uh, from now, I mean, before we start, I, will, I would like to also on the behalf of SP Azerbaijan members and society in general, would like to thank you for the time you're dedicating for us and you sharing your new obtained knowledge, your feelings and your new experience with us. Uh, so thank you very much for that. And uh, I think uh, we can kick off the talk. I, I will also be intervening sometimes to ask, to ask you tricky questions, as I like to do. Uh, but the stage is fully yours and uh, of participants. Thank you for introducing me. So let me start sharing the screen. Uh, there you go. It says host disabled the participant screen sharing. For some reason. So, yeah. Oh, uh, just a second. Let me see. So, what I can do to that because so, so just some of, uh, can you try it again? I, I guess I finished the options. Oh, yeah, yeah, it works, it works. Oh. Okay. So, again, hello to everyone. Thanks to everyone who is who is joining us today. And my name is Ilgar again. And today I'm going to cover, going to be covering this, how like about the studying in the US, overall the information that I, that I gained here while I was studying in the US, all the cool things here. And what are you going to get if you choose to study in the US? And then at the end, I'll give you some information about and some tips about how to apply and what do you need to have in order to apply and order to get in, into one of the US universities. So let's start with a quick introduction. Uh, so I'm a master of science student here in the Texas state and the capital of Texas in the Austin city at the University of Texas at Austin and I'm studying petroleum engineering. I also work as a graduate research assistant under supervision of a Dr. Kuno. And I graduated from uh, Boko Higher Oil School uh, last year. Uh, okay, so now let's move to benefits of studying in the US. So first, the first fascinating fact uh, that I discovered here is the scale of the campus. It's, it's just gigantic. The, as you can see on the map, it's, it's pretty big. And all, the, all these, as you can see, red, red buildings are, are basically separate departments. Every department has its own building and the campus itself is pretty big. About 50,000 students are studying in the university every year. 
And this is not true only for my campus, it's true for almost any university in the US. All of them are, almost all of them are gigantic. And for example, my university has 17 libraries. Uh, almost any department has its own library, but there's also one huge library that is available to anyone and also has seven museums. And for those of you who like sports, there's a big gymnasium that has almost any type of sport that you can imagine. And almost all of them are free of charge because it's included in the tuition fee. So it's pretty nice. And also there is an interesting fact about my university that as you can see this football stadium, this football stadium is located in the, in the campus of the university. This is the university's uh, football team stadium and uh, it's ninth biggest stadium in the world by capacity. So, but what makes a university a university is a learning opportunity. So the classes are taught by world famous professors that are easily approachable. You can easily approach your professor and ask any question you need and they most probably did. I'm almost sure that they will answer any questions that you'll have because those those are the people who write the books and know almost everything about the subject. And you also have ability to choose among a lot of classes from different departments. You don't have to follow some kind of some kind of classes that the university tells you. You can choose the classes you want. There is some kind of requirement. You just need to uh, you just need to take some classes, but the rest of the classes you can choose yourself. And what is important as well is for those who are doing research, it's very important to have an access to, to all the journals, to any research paper you need for your research purposes. So which, it, which you can have at any, almost any university or the university you can have free uh, access to any research paper. And so then Next, what is very important as well, for example, if you have any projects and you need some kind of software like MATLAB or a console or any simulation software, for example, you get almost any of those free of charge again through the university. And what I use a lot as well is study rooms. For example, when I need to study on a subject before finals with my friends or we work on a project together, so with, you can book, there are plenty of study rooms available. I can always find this study room and you can go, and this is by the way, one of the, the picture from my university study room. And you can find always a good study room with a board and the TV to practice your presentation skills or whatever you want. So that's about this. And what else is very interesting in the, in the US universities is the advancement of technology and research. So for example, what my university is famous for is the, the supercomputer and the Frontier system, which is installed in our university by a Dell company, is the fifth fastest supercomputer in the world. So for other universities will have some other other things that they're famous for. And ours is just famous for supercomputer. And for example, in our department, in petroleum engineering department, almost any professor has some numerous labs, numerous office spaces, some computers to run simulations and stuff. For example, my professor has five or six numerous five or six labs and some separate several office spaces. And every graduate student gets its own office with its own computer. And then uh, what is really important, important for the encouragement and motivation uh, in order to keep you up working uh, is that your research is impactful. You can, you can see that from the number of publications and the citations you'll probably hopefully get that your research is impactful, which, is, which feels really nice. So, but what is a research? I wanted to talk, talk a bit about this and how research works. So research is, uh, is like a, some kind of creative work or investigation about any topic or any issue that you have or in industry or the humanity have that you need to solve basically. 
and you're solving that by coming up with the new methodologies or establishing new facts and coming with the new uh, conclusions. So how it's done, it could be done in different ways. For example, the professors or scientists themselves could think of, a, of an issue and they can think of a, of a methodology to solve it. Like for example, I can give you an example, like professors know that modeling of a surfactant is, a, is not really accurate. And so if they come up with a new methodology, they can uh, create a proposal, get some funding from Department of Energy. This is one way. And there's another way is to get all those projects from the industry directly. So this is what mainly is happening. Uh, for example, if tomorrow some kind of company have any issues during the production of oil or drilling or exploration, whatever, it doesn't matter. So during the process, if they have any issues, if they cannot solve themselves, they usually address their issues to, to scientists or to professors, let's say. So the professors from the department, uh, some of them are like separate or some of them are in the Center for Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering, which is basically research center of, the, of, of my department. So what's happening is some professors are, again, as I said, in the center and some professors are separate. The companies know those professors separately. So they address their issues to professors. And then professors may come up with the methodology together with their research associates, maybe alone, maybe with PhD students. But then who, at the end of the day, who is going to solve this issue? The issue is going to be solved mainly by not really professor. Professor is the one who is guiding and telling what to do, but the one who is performing the work is actually the PhD students or the master's students, the graduate students. So, uh, so this is how it's happening. The, uh, the companies have issues, they address it to professors and professors basically give it to PhD students. And uh, at, this is the entire system and everyone is happy. Companies get their job done, professors become more famous, and PhD students get their degree and they get paid for the job they're doing and they work on the real life industry and they get real life industry experience working on real projects. So, this is how it's happening in the US. So, but this is not the only thing that is important. What is also important is to get some communication skills as well. So you can, by studying in the countries like US or UK, you can improve your English language skills a lot. But it's not going to be immediate, not going to be like one year or two. During a long period of time, you can improve your English a lot. And also what is important is getting a valuable intercultural experience. So I've met so many different people from so many different countries that I didn't even honestly know existed. So this is pretty nice as well. And then as well, if you want to have, if you're going to have friends, you'll need to uh, keep, up, keep up with the news and you'll have to broaden your horizon. So that's also very important to broaden your horizon because everyone here is, knows almost everything. So, and uh, what is very interesting as well, that's why I kept it to the last as a dessert is if you have any startup idea, that's this US is pretty much the best country for starting up a business. As this is a capitalistic country, this is where your business mm -hmm. will thrive the most. Okay, so enough about the benefits. So now let's talk about the applying itself to US universities. So many of you already know the benefits of the US universities, right? But why do so few students apply, uh, actually apply to US? Yeah, obvious reason is the education is very expensive, but there are plenty of available scholarships that you need to know about. For example, one of them is a graduate research assistantship. Is, this is the scholarship I have. It covers your tuition fee uh, completely and also gives you a salary because you're, as a graduate student, you're working on the research. You're, as an assistant of a professor, you're working on the research. You're helping, if you remember the map I showed, the projects get from the companies to professors and you help those professors. So that's what professor pay for your tuition and give you some salary. 
And also there's a teaching assistantship. It's when you help a uh, professor to give a lecture basically for you can help them for a class to grade some homeworks or assignments. This is a teaching assistantship. It also covers your tuition fee completely, but it doesn't give you as much salary as a GRA gives you. There's also administrative work that you can do. I'm not really familiar with administrative assistantship, but there are some people doing that as well. Also, there is a fellowship. The fellowship can be given in a different amounts. The, I don't honestly know how they choose, but there are people who are getting like uh, 40,000 a year of a fellowship. There are people who are getting just $5,000 a year of a fellowship. So this really depends. Sometimes you can get fellowship as well as one of those graduate research assistantships, which is really nice. And uh, the last one <clears throat> is a Fulbright. Also, <clears throat> Fulbright scholarship is for foreign students, for international students, and it also covers entire tuition fee, which is also really good. So, so I'd like to tell you about some myths that I personally had, and I think that probably some of you may have it as well. So the, the many colleges, multi college college students, sorry, <clears throat> say that they want to study abroad, but around 5% of them actually do it, but it's not because they didn't get in or something, it's just because they were kind of scared to apply. They didn't believe into themselves. They didn't believe in themselves. So the myth one is, they think that they need to be smart as Einstein, they need to invent a bicycle or something. But no, that's not true. Uh, I will talk a bit more about this in the next upcoming slide. Uh, but just helping a PhD, PhD student, if you can find a PhD student, work on some literature review may also be enough to get into a decent, a good school. Myth two is that students studying in Azerbaijan think that their knowledge is very bad and they will not be able to study in the US because they think that everyone here is super smart or something. Yeah, I mean, like, it could be that knowledge given in Azerbaijan is not very great, honestly, but, but still, you will be able to keep up with the students here. And, and why is that? Because the teaching methods are, are so good and that you get weekly assignments every time. So that's so you get, and you don't study alone as well. So you get opportunity to, learn on a weekly basis you always learn and uh, you always have great professors or teaching assistants that you can approach and ask questions and you and as i said the professors are so good that you you always find the answer to your question so that's why you don't you don't have any problems and that's why you learn more and the process is actually easier here so it's easier to study here than in Azerbaijan. so and the myth three that most people have, they think that their accent can restrict, they, they can basically restrict the ability to communicate with others and people may think, okay, this guy has an accent, so people, you may think that people are not gonna listen to you, but that's not true, that's not true at all. People don't even care about your accent, so don't be discouraged if you have an accent, just speak more. Okay, enough about this. So what do you actually need? to have in order to apply to university. So this is uh, probably the most anticipating part of this presentation. Uh, list of, this is the list of the requirements that you need in order to apply to US university. So in order to get into university, you need to have obviously a good GPA. You, you'll need to take a GRE general test. You'll need to take IELTS or TOEFL test you'll need to have some recommendation letters and you'll need to write a meaningful and interesting SOP or a statement of purpose or motivation letters. So these, these five requirements are important just to get into university. So if you have these good, you're most probably gonna get into university. But if you get in, you may have a problem of, uh, of a funding. You may not get a funding. So in order to get funding, you'll need to get, if you remember one of those scholarships, I'll add this slide here again. So available scholarships. If you remember, I told you there is a graduate research assistantship. I think this and the teaching assistantship is 
is the ones that are easier to get the scholarship. So in order to get the graduate research assistantship, which is you not know, very difficult to get and uh, it pays a lot as well. In order to get this, you basically need to prove to a professor that is going to pay for your tuition and for your going to give you a salary. You need to prove him that you have some kind of research experience and that you are going to help him doing a research. So for that, you'll need to have some research experience. So this part is important in order to get some kind of scholarship. So this is in order to get into university and this is to get budget research assistantship. So as a research experience, how you can get a research experience in Azerbaijan. So one of the ways is to uh, enter the Link Research and Development Center. This is the way I did my research. I did it at Link Research and Development Center. So I encourage you to get into here. Uh, uh, but if, even if you're not getting in, don't be discouraged. That's not a, a big issue. You can still do research on your own somehow. For example, if you can find a PhD student at in Azerbaijan, so you can find some kind of a PhD student. And if even if you don't do entire research yourself, uh, because, because uh, professors here don't really expect you, if you're a bachelor student now, they don't really expect you to have, have done, to, to, to do entire research yourself. They don't expect you to do that. The bachelor students don't do that, even, like even in US. Bachelor students are really the ones, uh, usually the ones who just help PhD students or master students. So if you find some kind of PhD student and you help him gather data or help him in manipulating your data or just not really entire research, but some kind of aspect of your research, that could be enough as well. So, or you could do, if you, you cannot even find a PhD student, you may be, you may, may just do some liter literature review. You can read some research papers on some kind of a topic. I do uh, an interesting literature review, come to some kind of conclusions and give this, maybe write it in the form of paper and send it to a professor to prove that you're able to analyze the data, analyze the research papers. So I think this is, that's it. And thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Edgar, thank you very much for the talks. Uh, if we would have been in one room, I guess there would have been many applauses, but <laughs> due to the <laughs> online conference, we can, I would, you know, applause you much here. Thank you, um, thank you. <laughs> so um, I would ask the audience, I see uh, students here, so please bombard Edgar with questions. I, uh, I would say that he had touched several topics in terms of the life in the U.S., um, in, ter in terms of the studies and all of that. Maybe till people uh, think about uh, their questions, I would like to ask you. So you mentioned that it's quite, uh, I mean, opportunistic to the startup idea and progress it in the U.S. So I'm wondering if you have anything in your mind. Of course, if it's not a top secret thing, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think for now I have. No, I don't think I have any startup ideas. Okay. If I had, I would apply <laughs> immediately. Um, yeah, All right. I guess there is, I'm not like that profic proficient with Zoom, but it, what does that end mean? Someone want to ask a question or what? Yeah, actually, I wanted to ask a question. First of all, hello, everyone, and thank you, Ilgar, for this presentation. Thank you. I have some questions about, one uh, is about scholarships. Is it possible to apply for several scholarships at the same time and wait for the uh, result? And, for example, if I get two of them and I choose the one which offers higher money, for example? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You can apply for, for example, let me, speak, let me share the screen again. Uh, okay, so yeah, you can, for example, apply to graduate research assistantship and teaching assistantship. It actually happens at the same time. It's not, honestly, it's not you who, cho who chooses what happens, but, but again, it depends on the department could change. But it usually, the 
professors or the department who chooses what you're going to get, graduate research assistantship, assistantship or teaching. But you can also at the same time apply to Fulbright. And also the fellowship is, is also automatically will be given to you. You don't even need to apply for that. So yeah, you can, you're basically applying to all of them at the same time you can. Okay, thank you very much. And one more question. For example, you said that like one of the important points is about GPA. Let's say uh, when I graduated from the university, my GPA was not very high. But for example, uh, after having several year working experience, do you think it will be like helpful for me to get into that university without having uh, so high GPA? Uh, I think yes. The, the experience, work experience helps a lot. That is true. And also, even if like one of them, it may, may not be even GPA or maybe your Jerry score is low. Like one being one of them being low, uh, is not, it's not, it doesn't mean that you're not going to get in. Like even if your GPA is low, but the rest of the things is amazing, you still have a high chances to get in. But you also need to keep in mind that if GPA is very low, it's like even lower than three, but I don't think it's happening in Azerbaijan. But if it's lower than three, for example, or 3.3, .3, then your application will not be even reviewed. It will automatically be rejected. So if your GPA is very low, GRE is very low, or IELTS and TOEFL scores are very low, then your application will automatically be rejected and they will not even review your application. So there's this. To that. Thank you very much. Well, Uh, hello, Ilgar. Thank you very much for your presentation. I wanted to ask one question, if it's possible. Yeah, sure. Thank uh, you. Can you please say, like, how much time it's needed to prepare for that GRE test, and how much it take you? It took you. Well, it really depends from person to person, but usually it takes like maybe a couple months. Because the GRE, GRE, okay, consists of, you probably know, but GRE consists of the, gener, uh, the quantitative part, which is the math, basically, and which is like a school math, which is pretty easy. You don't need to even spend a lot of time on that. But there's also, but there's a verbal part, which is very difficult, which a lot of students struggle. I barely scored 150. It's very difficult to score the verbal. So you need to learn a lot of words. So if you have a pretty good, good vocabulary, uh, you may do it pretty quickly, but usually it will take probably a couple months to learn a lot of words in the verbal section for GRE. Maybe okay, two months. Well, well, but generally, like uh, several months for preparation are enough. Like you did it in the, your last uh, year of the bachelor degree, or you did it like in the fourth year and then or fifth year. Well, I, I, I did, yeah, I did it in, in like one month. So it's, it's possible. I, again, if you have a good vocabulary, it's, it's easier. And again, but there, there's one thing I want to tell everyone. So many people think that you need to learn words only. That's, uh, that's not very helpful. You need to more pay attention to, there's a reading section. If you're gonna take the test now, there's a reading section, you'll have to more, pay attention to how to do reading because it will, so for example, from my experience, like I saw how many questions were correct and how many were wrong. So out of those that required knowing knowledge of a word itself, uh, the type of questions, sentence completion, I forgot already. So those are all were wrong, basically. So learning words was useless for me. So I scored my score just because of the reading. So I would, like my tip would be, to pay more attention to reading, read more newspapers and stuff, and it will help you a lot. So yeah, one month is enough as well. Okay, thank you very much. Is there anyone else? Brave person, <laughs> maybe interested in some specifics? If, God, if you don't mind, I have a question for you regarding yes. supercomputer. How do you shift 
the access between the departments and people? Is there a specific policy for the queue if you want to run something on it? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that if I want to run a simulation, they'll give me an access to that. But I think it's, for example, I know the fact it's used now. Oh, sorry, where is that? So it, it's used now to, they're trying to solve the COVID-19 issue using this computer. They're doing some modeling. But I think if professor thinks that the supercomputer is required, so the professor may require so maybe some slots from the supercomputer. But this usually doesn't happen. In our department, we don't need as much. We don't need supercomputer. So we don't, we usually, we usually do it on our own computers. We have a bit smaller version of it. Not a bit, a much smaller version of it. So we have some kind of computers in our department. We use those. But again, if, for example, if tomorrow someone needs, I don't know, maybe quantum mechanics simulations, they probably, can get this supercomputer, yes. I see, I see. So talking about the way, I also, uh, I, I think it would be beneficial for the students in the talk to know in general, what was your strategy in selection of courses at UT Austin? Which courses did you take and why? So, I took courses that are more to, to increase my background because uh, as I was describing, I didn't have, when I came from Azerbaijan, I was lacking some knowledge in mathematics, but I still lack, so, but the, the, it was very bad. So I decided to take some mathematics courses. So every semester had some mathematics courses. That's what, that was the most important thing for me. And then the next thing I took, uh, the subjects that were interesting to me, like for example, one of them was transport phenomena. I was just interested in the fluid flow, diffusion and heat flow, how to model it on, on the physics level. And, and then there were some requirements that I just had to take, even though I didn't want to, but there's some couple like that. For example, I took EUR class. I, was, had, I had to just take class from petroleum engineering as well. And, and the, in the petrophysics class. So these are the classes I took. And the thermodynamics. All right. Um, uh, Ilgar, are you involved in SPE over there? Uh, not right now, honestly. Um, now trying to concentrate on my classes more then on my extracurricular activities, I need to like keep up with other students. So that's why I'm trying to study more, gain some knowledge. And then yes, I will, I'm trying, uh, I have in my plan to get into SPE. So, but I guess you observe how bachelor, master students, you know, do have activities. I, I would, I, I would guess that most of the bachelor students are doing that, right? So do you really observe what type of exercises, what type of activities do they have? Are you noticing some, some really interesting stuff over there? Uh, I'm, I'm noticing some lectures. That's what I honestly notice. Mostly they, uh, some companies are coming, SP is organizing some events when the companies come to university and we have some some lectures, maybe some one-time lectures about some topics like in Azerbaijan. I haven't observed, oh no, they, they, they've done some field trips as well, but it, it's it's like it's like in Azerbaijan pretty much. Azerbaijan is, is very good at, at this point, uh, in this matter, I mean. And uh, uh, when it comes to bachelor and master students, I've seen actually a lot of master students as well I, you don't see a lot of PhD students, honestly, but you see a lot of master students and a lot of bachelor students. The both of them. Good. I guess I asked all my questions. Uh, Thank so, you for the questions. Yeah. Thank you for answering. So let's just maybe give some space. 
I, I, I'll shut up for a second to see if anyone takes my place. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I wanted to ask one more question uh, related to research. Like how many uh, years or like what period of your time you spend on doing a research and how much is required to do? So I spend about a year and a half, I think, doing research. But you can definitely do it in a shorter amount of time. You can, like I, I know some students that did research, they started doing it in summer and they, the next, they, they applied the next, when there was the next deadline. So you can do it maybe in half a year even, or, but, well again, it depends again, what, what is your project? If you, for example, do it in EI-Link, EI-Link Research and Development Center, the projects are, I think, usually like a couple of years. But again, it depends. It, it may be six months, two years, maybe, maybe less. If you're doing some literature review or if you're helping some PhD students, if you find, you can do it quicker as well. Like three months is maybe could be enough for a quick research. <laughs> 